All right, I'm here to do my first all-time interview on my YouTube channel, and I'm interviewing a friend of mine, uh, a great friend of mine, and who's been a great encourager of mine, uh, especially when it was my career was really just struggling and beginning. He said, you got this kid, basically. <laughs> so, um, and this is Joe DeBlasi, and I'm just going to read you some of his credits so you get a sense of what he's accomplished over the years as a, in a career, as a session musician mostly. Um, here are some movies that he, he played on. Independence Day, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, The Karate Kid, Lady Hawk, Officer and a Gentleman, uh, Rocky 1 and 3, Somewhere in Time, which I always liked that movie because it was filmed in Michigan, yeah. um, Stripes and Ghostbusters. Really, you played on Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, television shows, Bionic Woman, M.A.S.H., Quantum Leap, Dukes of Hazard, which I know I heard you on that, Quincy, I heard you on that, Fame, Golden Girls. I mean, that's like a huge show right now. That show is huge <laughs> right now. Happy Days. Uh, were you ever on that with Carl Verheyen on Happy Days? Uh, yeah, maybe, I don't recall. Yeah. <laughs> uh, already a good interview. <laughs> Sorry, I just messed with you. Uh, Knott's Landing, Vegas, Laverne and Shirley, Wonder Woman, L.A. Law, Love Boat, Young and Restless. Um, and then you worked with Burt Bacharach, who is one of my favorite top ten writers of all time. Great mm -hmm. melodies, unbelievable melodies. And, and Bill Conti, who did the, the Rocky scores. Christopher Cross, Michael McDonald, Dionne Warwick, Peebo Bryson, Frank Sinatra. I may have to get it if there's a story there. Phil Spector, we may have to talk about that okay. if there's a story there. We're just going to be talking about stories. Um, and uh, Ray Charles, Phil Collins, Bette Midler. I know the Bette Midler story, and you have to tell it. Okay. okay, if you if you don't mind, if you, fine. Yeah, I'm fine with but but if I'm going to send this to you, Joe, I'm going to send this to you before I post it, <laughs> and if you you tell me to edit anything out, okay, it's fine. Okay, all right, because I don't want to get you in trouble. All right, but anyway, it's that's just the crazy. I mean, that's a that's a pretty crazy list looking back on it, and so I just want to ask you. You grew up in this area, right? Yes. In what, what city did you technically grow up in? Van Nuys. Van Nuys. I, okay. You know, when I, my parents lived in Van Nuys, so I, I was there with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we your moved, mom yeah. still with us. We moved to Van Nuys uh, from Cleveland when I was five. Oh, okay. So, so you were born in Cleveland. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But you grew up here. How old were you when you started playing guitar? Twelve. Oh, okay. And and then who were your influences early on? I mean, I know one obvious, right? The Beatles, right? Okay. When I was twelve, the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, and I, I, my parents made me play accordion before that. <laughs> yeah. And um, actually, the funny story: my um, my now father, well, my now father-in-law, who's deceased, um, Frank Morocco. Frank Morocco, who's probably the best accordion player that's ever lived. Yeah. Um, he uh, he was my accordion teacher when I was a kid. No way. Yes. Yeah, so I was ten and taking accordion lessons, and my now wife was three. And so That's our cool. families became friends. When, when, um, uh, when, when I uh, decided I wanted to play guitar and not accordion, Frank talked my parents into letting me quit accordion and playing guitar. Uh, he said, this instrument's a curse. What do you want him to play the accordion for? <laughs> so It's the part of many jokes. Right. Yeah, he said, he wants to play guitar. Let him play guitar. So uh, so that's when I started studying guitar, and like I said, our families had become close, you know, friends. Yeah. But kind of drifted apart when I quit playing guitar or quit playing accordion and went to guitar. Right. But then when I became a studio musician, um, Frank and I would work together on a lot of movies and and things. He said uh, he talked sort of like uh, like uh, you know the Godfather voice. Hey, hey, Joe, uh, you remember my little daughter Lisa? And I said, Well, I remember a little, you know three-year-old, yeah. he said, well, she's she's a professional ice skater. She's with ice capades, and she's dating a skater that I hate. <laughs> he said, next time she, she's in town, why don't you take her try and take her out? So, <laughs> so I went to hear him one, uh, play one night at Dante's, which was... Yeah, I remember Dante's. Dante's. Yeah. yeah. And um, she uh, had... Like her ship. Right. Yeah, yeah. She happened to be in town, and she was there. So we hit mm -hmm. it off. We hit it off like, like that. Oh, that's it. So it was an arranged marriage. <laughs> and how long have you been married now? Oh, we just hit 40 years. That's, that's so great. I mean, that's, you know, that's like 140 in Hollywood years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I always say. You know. Okay, so, um, so who else? So, some other influences. The Beatles. Beatles, so. were, Beatles were big. Uh, Rolling Stones, Cream. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I was uh, a big Jeff Beck freak back then. But then I, I, was, I was totally into um, 
uh, West Montgomery and, you know... Uh, Hometown of mine. I'm from yeah. Indianapolis. So. Oh, yeah. So, um, jazz was... Uh, uh, I, I was all. I always had jazz on the back burner, yeah. uh, while I was, uh, you know, playing in rock bands and everything else. So I was, um, uh, I was influenced big time um, later on by like Matheny yeah. and um, just and classical guitarists too. Some of the classical guitarists that influenced you. Uh, classical guitar player Julian Bream, yeah. um, Christopher Parkening, who actually has become a real close friend. I, I, I had dinner with him a couple years ago. Yeah? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. He had some great stories. Oh, yeah. Uh, Chris is an amazing guy. Yeah. And uh, I actually got to play for Segovia, oh, uh, yes. which, and, you know, I, I thought, I didn't think about it before, but after, I wasn't nervous at all. Talk, playing for Segovia, I, I, I would have thought that, you know, I would have been just crazy nervous at the time. Did you know how big, how important he oh, was? Of course, I used to go. Uh, I used to go hear him in concert all the time. But for some reason, I don't know. It was God looking over me or something. Right, right, said, right. You're not going to be nervous. So yeah. um, uh, I played for him, and I wasn't nervous a bit. I think though that's that's one of the almost prerequisites to being a good session musician in general, because if you're really prone to being nervous mm -hmm. or stage fright. You know, getting in front of a, sitting in front of an orchestra like you would have to often do, I couldn't do it. I, I my hands just get lock finger, and I get too shaky, and I make m stupid mistakes and smart mistakes. But I make mistakes. Well, and you are, I've seen you in sessions and in, in, in live situations where the reading is insane, and you're fearless. And I think that's a, a valuable skill to have, wouldn't you say? Well, I may look fearless, but <laughs> well, yeah, <that's> <laughs> yeah. you don't know what's going on on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing is, the more you do it, the uh, funny, another funny story, when my very first recording session, um, Tommy Tedesco was, was actually the one that basically walked me into a career as right. a, as a oh, session. We're gonna have, I'm going to have you tell the, right. how that happened. Yeah. So but, what was the first session? Well, so the first session I was at, um, uh, I was at Universal Studios and doing a, I don't remember if it was a TV movie or whatever it was for, for a composer named Pete Rugolo. And the way he would write is he would look at the scene and change meter instead of changing, um, you know, uh, uh, he would change meter like either every bar or wherever he needed to change meter. Wow. So here, my very first session, I'm reading 3, 8, um, 6, 4, uh, 16, 8, uh, you know, it all next to each other. And you're having to count all this. And, yeah. you know, and then it would go to a bar of 7, and then a yeah. bar of 2. And it would be like, and this is my very first session, so uh, I was so nervous. My hands were shaking at that point. Yeah. And I somehow got through it, but I have no recollection of how I got through it. Yeah. I mean, it was just... I was, Angels were holding your hands. I was on yeah. the edge of my seat. And, you know, it was... Oh, yeah. um, uh, just because, you know, the sight reading at that point, um, when you're on the, on the hot seat and having to sight read on top of it, you have to not only play, but you have to, you know, you're looking at it for the first time, so. Yeah, and play with feeling and all that. And, and whatever. <laughs> make it sound like you, yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's one of the markers. I mean, I, I remember doing sessions, I did a couple sessions with Michael Thompson, and he could pull up a chart and make it eat a sound. That was the thing he was really good at, is getting a really good sound for the scene right. and for the moment. And he made it sound like he'd been playing it for six months. Like, oh, yeah, like he wrote the song. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a, a rare skill right there. Well, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a kind of a trick to that because basically they're calling, first of all, they're calling you generally for what you do. That's true. So you do what you see on the paper in relation to what you do to who you are <laughs> to who you are how so, you're wired right yeah and no I, I that's exactly right well i hear that a lot now in my career uh -huh. um and it was pointed out to me by a very young producer who i said what do you want me to do on this and he said stralify it <laughs> and i went what does that mean he goes well you do your thing i like how you play and exactly. I went, that was the first time i'd ever even thought about it that way exactly yeah yeah so they're calling you yeah uh, i mean if if it's not just, you know, a random call or whatever, yeah. they're calling you for what they know you do. Right. And and what they know they could count on you for. So then right. when they have notes written, you play it according to the way you play. Right, right. So, now, did you go to school for guitar or music? I, I went to Cal State Northridge. For four years? Um, no, I went to, to Pierce 
Pierce College got all the general ed stuff out of the way, right. and then went to Cal State Northridge for a couple Save years. Saved mom and dad a couple bucks. Yeah, yeah, that's what and, my kids did. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but you know, I got the I got the GE stuff out of the way. Yeah, yeah, and then and then went on to Cal State Northridge, and I wanted to I wanted to study jazz, but they didn't offer anything but classical. And Ron Purcell, who was my teacher, right. was I mean he was a world famous classical guitar guy. I mean uh, yeah, he's yeah. on the way I met Segovia is he would uh, every time Segovia was in town, he would come to Cal State Northridge and do a master class. Right. So it's like. It turns out that Cal State Northridge, at the time, may have been one of the top schools in the world yeah. for classical guitar. Yeah. So uh, I was very fortunate in having uh, having to learn classical guitar, but it didn't come easy. I, I had never I had never played classical or anything fingerstyle. I always used a pick up until I got into college, yeah. and um, my my first teacher in college wouldn't let me touch the neck of the guitar for six months. He made me play rest strokes and free stroke and and yeah. work on my right hand and I I was so frustrated I wanted to quit I yeah. hated it and I then finally it clicked and then and I got to the point to where my right hand is pretty pretty solid. I had some right hand skills right when I went to college and I had to study classical guitar because at Butler they didn't have any other degree there was right. something else you get and this would have been seventy nine and um, but they were all like. Blackbird and and mm -hmm. fingerstyle jazz stuff that my teacher was showing me, right. like jazz arrangements of things. So I was doing that, or um, but I had my my wrist was collapsed, my right. hand was collapsed, right. and so my lessons were like he would just be grabbing my wrist this and making me, <laughs> and then my I would do this, and then he would grab it. Yeah. <laughs> That's my memory of oh, my yeah. lessons. Exactly. It was purely me just like him slapping my wrist <laughs> and then grabbing it, and go, you know, exactly <laughs> for for a whole two semesters. Oh. Yeah, six months of, of basically going through that. Okay, so you already mentioned Tommy Tedesco, but I want you to tell the story of how you got... Because you're living in Los Angeles, which is really the epicenter of TV and film industry, and even the record industry, particularly in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Right. Um, there's a great movie. Um, I'll put a link here where you can see trailers for it called The Wrecking Crew. And um, you... It, it talks about these... Basically, it's 15 to 30 musicians that kind of populated... All of the um, film scores, well, mostly records. That was right. the big thing. Like Hal Blaine played on seven record of the years in a row. Right. Records of the year a row it, on for uh, the Grammys. Right. He played on seven in a row. Um, but you kind of came along, kind of at the tail end of that. So yeah. Seventy three is when you met Tommy. Nineteen seventy three. I I met Tommy probably in seventy two or seventy one. Okay. Um, and then he groomed me for a bit because my sight reading was horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, basically, um, I was I had, uh, I was playing classical guitar in a church on a on a Sunday, and he happened to be in the church. Oh, that's right. And so I'm playing. I was in the choir off by myself mm -hmm. and, and playing a solo, and all of a sudden, I look over and I see Tommy Tedesco standing in the doorway, and Tommy. Filled up most of the doorway, and he had a goatee. Yeah, he, and I, he had his hat, probably. Yeah, he, he. I mean, he was very recognizable. He, he very recognizable. Yeah. And so I, I, I look over and talk about nerve. I was way more nervous seeing Tommy stand there than I was playing for Segovia. And Tommy, and, and Tommy yeah. didn't play authentic classical guitar. But I look over and I see Tommy, and I go, oh, 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 you know, yeah, what yeah, do I yeah. do? And he goes, No, no, good, good, good. I like it, you know. And so I kept playing. And afterwards, he came up and said, Man, I, I dig the way you play. He said. Um, you play all the other styles? And I said, yeah, yeah, classical is kind of just an add-on thing. You know, I, I went to college and, and learned to play classical. So he said, well, you ever thought about becoming a studio musician? And um, I said, well, I thought somebody had to die, right, you know, right. first and, you know, and, and make space. And um, he, uh, he said, well, come on, hang out with me a little bit. And, you know, so he started taking me around to sessions and I'd look over his shoulder and he'd, he'd give me tips and pointers. That was, the best that was a bigger education than, than, so um, when than I could have ever gotten. Yeah, so school. when you got to the studio to work, you'd been there before. It wasn't a foreign environment. Right. right. Uh, um, I think, did I go to two sessions with Carl? Took me to a cheers date uh -huh. so I could see what it was like. And right. I was amazed. One of the things that really amazed me is how short the cues were. Right. Like you had... 
you had 10 minutes to look over three bars of music to kind of get it down while they were setting everything up and then, okay, let's take it. And then they would do it in one take. Right. And but then perfect. there's a st usually a stack of music. Yeah. So yeah. You know, they would they do several episodes in one right. city. Yeah. Right. So you'd have a stack of, you know, a stack of cues and, um, you know, most of the stuff, studio work, Tommy used to say, this is, this is a direct quote from Tommy. Um, studio work is ninety percent boredom and ten percent sheer terror. Yeah, yeah, I've heard so, that. I've heard that quote many, many that times. That came from Tommy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tommy. <laughs> and then you know, then there's charts that are eight pages long, and it's sight reading all the way through. Yeah. And you're like, I tell you, almost like the hardest thing is you're in a big orchestra day, and it's a difficult thing for an orchestra. You know, they're they've got like super hard passages and stuff, and and um, and you are tacit. Till yes. bar ninety eight. Tacit mean, meaning you have rest. You're not you playing. You don't for play ninety eight bars. So nine till, till bar ninety eight, and then and then you have a very exposed whole note. Yeah, yeah. And that is so hard because you're going sixty two, two, three, four, sixty three. You know, sixty four. Wait, wait. Was that sixty three or sixty four? Oh no, sixty three. Hopefully it was sixty four, sixty five. Yeah. And you're and you keep thinking. You know, you 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 just your mind starts to to. Go other places. Oh heck yeah! And then, and then when it comes time, if you put that note in the wrong place, the you, know, you just take you take heat from everybody else. Oh my god! Because yeah, <laughs> they, they just played ninety eight bars of music and you yeah. messed it all up. Exactly. That's why I always say, yeah, I'll be an overdub. I do orchestra dates, but I'm always an overdub now. Um, yeah, and now I thank God for the little baby notes. Do you you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Where they where it's like the flutes play this line right. The, right the bar before you're supposed to play. Right. So that helps a lot because because they, they're aware of that. Right. Like a, a good copyist who who does the charts is aware that if you've got 98 bars of rest, you need something to help you know when it's time to play. Not always. <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know. And that's kind of a newer thing, right? I, I imagine I mean, back in the day, it probably wasn't. Yeah, even they, 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 they didn't, you know, they didn't do anything except write your part at yeah. bar ninety-eight <laughs> or ninety-nine, oh, whatever it was. And some of those bars are seven, eight, and some of those bars are, you know, three, four, and then you got four, four for ninety-two bars yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. So, so Tommy. You sat next to Tommy. Tommy brought you to a session then at, at Maybe. some point. Oh, he, he started, he, he would bring me, whenever I whenever I was available, I would go on a session with him and, um, you know, be looking over his shoulder and he, he'd say, okay, see this? It's not playable on guitar, but I'm going to make the, I'm going to make the composer look good and I'm going to make him love it. So yeah. he'll, so it comes time for the, for a little thing that's written and he'll play something totally, totally different. That'll bring, you know, if he's on nylon string especially, although Tommy didn't play, um, he didn't play traditional classical guitar, right, right. he could pick up a nylon string guitar and make you cry. I mean, he could, the way he, the way he interpreted lines and the way he, the, the feeling that he had, he was a master at Is that him on the theme of M.A.S.H.? Um, there were three three guitar players on that. I believe on the theme, though the original uh, Suicide is Painless theme. Yeah, we um, uh, they were that was re-recorded every year. Oh, it was. Yeah. So oh, okay. um, I believe it was Tommy. Uh, uh, I don't know who did it. The I, I, I wasn't at the start of Mash. Oh, that was seventy two, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. So that's a year before you. So got them. right. So then when I started doing it, it was Dennis Buttermer, Tommy, and me. Okay. And, and so um, you did it one year then maybe. Do you think that's you on the on the intro? Uh, it, we all we had to re-record the intro every year. So yeah, there's more than one guitar on the intro. Yeah. Oh, okay. Three I guitars. always think of the one. Yeah. I used to teach that. Actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it it was three guitars and they had the parts broken up, and um, okay. but yeah, it was three guitars. That's cool. Yeah. So what was the first session that Tommy brought you to? Do you remember that one at all? I don't. That you played on. Oh. Uh, well, the, no. The, the first one that I played on was the one I told you about. Okay. The, okay. The, um, but I I didn't. The the sessions that Tommy brought me to, I never I never played on. Right, either. but then eventually you were sitting next to him. Oh yeah, when after after he would uh, the well, the way he recommended me, I'll, I'll tell you that story. We were um, one day I was with him at um, at Universal Studios, and he after the session he said, "Come here, I want you to meet somebody." So I went um, I went over with him, and uh, he introduced me to Sandy D. Crescent, who was you know, know Sandy. the the biggest contractor. I mean, she she's the, the only contractor I know that's ever had an agent. I mean, she oh was she was huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, he's you know he introduced me, Joe. This is Sandy, Sandy, Joe. He said, okay, go wait outside for me. I got some business with Sandy. 
and nothing more was said. I, I got home, I lived with my parents, I got home, my mom said, uh, Joe, sit down. So I said, why? She said, just sit down. So I did, she said, you're working at Universal Studios tomorrow for Sandy de Crescent. And she knew that that meant something? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. How did so, she know? Was she in the industry? My mom? Yeah. No, she, I mean, it's just she knew that, that I was trying to become a studio musician and that I had uh, spent the previous year sitting yes. in my room sight reading right. nine hours a day. Yeah. You um, really wood shopped it. Well, and wood and, and, it. And, yeah. Right. And that was another Tommy Tedesco story. Um, after backing, backtracking, when, um, when Tommy uh, uh, was taking me around to all these sessions, one day he said, well, come on over to the house. I want to uh, wanna check out, see how you sight read. And I, all of a sudden my heart started going like this because right. that wasn't a focus. You know, in, in college it was like you, you Memorized. Learn, learn pieces. Yeah, yeah. You know, you learn pieces and, and um, so the, the focus was not learning how to be a good sight reader. So I thought, oh no, my career's ended before it's even started. So uh, I, I went to Tommy's and he put something in front of me and I couldn't, I couldn't play past a, one bar without making mistakes. It was like, you know, he gave, and he gave me a tempo. I couldn't keep up with the tempo. It was horrible. So he said, well, you know, he said, you got, you've got all the skills except for the sight reading. He said, go home, study sight reading, and you call me when you're ready. And mm. so I, uh, I started studying with a guy named Joe Valenti, who I know that name. Who, yeah, yeah. He, had, he was a trumpet player, but he taught sight reading on any instrument. Yeah, yeah. You know, he he taught many studio musicians how to read. And then, uh, but he passed away. Uh, his books were just absolutely amazing. He right. self-published books. Okay, let's talk about sight reading a little bit. Because um, what do you have any tips for sight reading? I have a couple that I've given you know through the years, but. Um, um, anything comes to mind when you're sitting down and you get a chart thrown in front of you and you look at it, maybe it's just black with notes. What's the first thing you do? Look for positions, yeah. look for places, look for places where you could stay, you know, where, well, while you're reading, you know, you know the position that you're in and you can right. go in and out of that position, hopefully without, you know, without having to look down. That's what I, yeah, that's one of the things I say. Look for the lowest note, look for the highest note, and see if you can find a position on the guitar right. that contains both of those notes. Right. Then you don't have to move your hand at all. Right. And then you can keep your eyes on the chart, because as soon as you take your eyes off a complex chart, right. you're in trouble. The one thing is if, if the chart is is diatonic, if if it, uh, if it the the notes fall within within a key, yeah. you know, if you, if you feel, uh, if you play within that key, if you're playing like C major, you know, and uh, uh, you're playing it in in seventh position, um, it's it's easy to yeah, do that. Yes. But as soon as you get a chart where there's no key signature and um, lots of sharps and flats, lots of lots of sharps and flats, and and um, you know just chromatics and stuff like that, you have to be on it. You you just have to know the neck. Yeah. You have to know the neck. You have to know you know, where everything is, right. and, and um, if it's a really difficult chart, looking back and forth, looking at your hand and looking back up at the chart, you're going to eventually lose your place, mm -hmm. especially if the chart's moving at any, at any good, like at a good clip. Right. Um, you're going to eventually lose your place, so the thing is, know the neck so well that, you know, I mean, uh, look, you know, if you look with your peripheral vision, I can you could you could look at the chart and kind of train yourself to see your hand right. in in your peripheral vision. Yeah. Um, then you you know then you you kind of have the best of both. What's crazy though too, like um, Tommy would you know play. You always wanted to have a lot of different instruments so you could do doubles. It would mm -hmm. pay extra. Um, but he would almost have all of his doubles tuned like a guitar, like you said, a mandolin, the mm -hmm. top four string guitar. But you don't do that, right? Uh, do you I do that did, with any? I did up until I got my new mandolin. I just I recently okay. I, I wanted a I, I bought a, a new mandolin. And I always kept two mandolins in my in my guitar trunk. One tuned like a, a real mandolin, okay. the other tuned like a guitar in case the sight reading was you know if it was right. single line stuff where I, I had to do. I have that same thing. I have a mandolin that's tuned like a mandolin. And I have a twelve string mandolin that's. Play, it's like a 12-string guitar, only an octave up, and I can sight read single notes on it if it's very complex, particularly if the if the rhythms are complex. Right. 
Um, the notes not so much don't bother me so much. It's when the rhythms are non-consistent. Right. That really, I don't want to have to be thinking about what mandolin scales do I need to use. Right. But I love playing mandolin. So a, now banjo, did you leave it tuned? Like a five-string banjo, would you always leave it tuned to G? No, I, I, I tuned a five-string banjo uh, traditional. Yeah, and you yeah. used. You probably played banjo. Do you ever play banjo on TV? Uh, what, what's the show I I said? I, um, Dukes of Hazard. Did you play banjo on Dukes of Hazard? No. No, I never played. played uh, no, uh, that was Larry McNeely was the, okay. the banjo player, and then um, Larry. The last, uh, I think, the last season of of Dukes, um, Larry moved back to Nashville. Okay. So I recommended this guy Bill Knopf, who's an amazing banjo player. In fact, I just did a gig with him this past week. Oh, cool! Um, and uh, he he's he's an excellent amazing banjo players. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. so we, they always had a, a specific they had chair. A, a ringer. A, a, a specific chair for banjo. Oh, and there okay. were five guitar players. Wow, who were some of the five? Let's, 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 like, I know it was probably well, rotating, but... Well, but it, 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 the, Tommy? No, no, Tommy wasn't on that. Okay. It was uh, Tim May, yep. Mitch Holder, yep. Mitch Holder uh, John yeah. Morrell. I don't know John. John, okay. yeah, uh, John Morrell, um, uh, Tommy Rotella, and me. Tommy, yeah. And you, okay. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, and, and sometimes there would be, um, this was a, another session where we'd be on the edge of our chair the whole time because a lot of those chase scenes and stuff, um, there would be stuff written specifically and we'd be, sometimes we'd have to play um, harmony guitar parts, five part harmonies and stuff. Oh so, you know, uh, and yeah. you're reading at a pretty good clip. So, yeah, yeah, up tempo um, stuff, yeah. So yeah, we would, uh, <laughs> after, after those sessions, we would always, uh, they used to do them at Warner Brothers in Burbank, and we'd always go over to, um, uh, uh, what was it, um, oh, the Mexican restaurant uh, oh, there. Uh, we, we'd, we'd have margaritas and afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to take the edge off. Yeah, yeah because the sight reading, high yeah. speed stuff, and for me, like being with other guitar players, that's, that's that competitive thing too. Right. So all that adrenaline, you want to kind of you get, before you go home to the wives, you want you want to have that <laughs> adrenaline gone. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, you, so you did a lot of TV and films. Was there a film? I, I, I we talked about this the other day. I asked you if you played on Officer and a Gentleman. I think you said you were the only guitar player on that. Yeah. So all the guitars you hear on that are Joe uh, playing on Officer and a Gentleman, and. I I was reminded of, of that and the iconic, particularly the very last scene um, where Richard Gere picks up, uh, what's her name, uh, uh, I can't think of the female lead, uh, in the factory. Um, there's a big guitar solo in there and there's power chords and all this. I'm, I'm assuming it was overdubs. Yeah. Was um, overdubs. And, uh, but the Simpsons referenced it at one point and they did kind of a kind of a schlocky version of it, you know, kind of making fun of it, but at the same time revering it, like uh, the Simpsons do, you know, they're, right. they're always using real life. Have you ever worked on a Simpsons episode? I didn't. You did not? I've okay. Never, never. It's cool, though, because one of the things I think they do, Simpsons and Family Guy both have real musicians on them, because if they used synthesizers, it would sound too much like a Saturday morning, low-budget cartoon. Right. Um, and they want, it's primetime show, so what they do is to take this two-dimensional show, they put a real orchestra on it and that gives it a little bit more seriousness like it's for adults not for kids right. um, and I, I, I've always respected that they've done that now I think the new shows I'm not sure what they're doing now but because they changed composers just mm -hmm. a couple years ago right uh, but that's I think they're on season 32 I know ridiculous. <laughs> is that amazing ridiculous. I mean that's 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 a serious career for some of those musicians and yeah. I know I know some of them that have been on it a couple oh, yeah. a couple players so Give me a couple Tommy Tedesco stories. Well, Tommy Tommy was um, really funny. Yeah, <laughs> really funny. Uh, one time we were working on a on a Sunday on a it was the the composer was Billy Goldenberg, okay. and um, uh, Tommy had spent the weekend at his beach house, and he fell asleep in the sun, and he was lobster red. I mean, he was burned up. He was burnt to a crisp. Yeah. He didn't have many days off. No. No, but he had a day off. He he had uh, he he had the uh, he had uh, Friday. He probably went up Friday night and spent Saturday there, and, and then came straight to the session on Sunday. But he fell asleep in the sun on Saturday, yeah. and he literally he was he was as red as as a as you'd 
ever picture anybody being, yeah. I mean, as, as sunburned as you could possibly And he had a, what's called a studio tan, which means no tan at right. all, white as a sheet. Exactly. So you're really susceptible to right. that. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and he, he was a big guy, so he yeah. had a lot of area to be, to be burned. So we, he, we get to the session, and he's just suffering. He's suffering. So, uh, and we're sitting right in front of the podium, the, the guitars, and then the, the whole orchestra behind us. Yeah. And Tommy takes off his shirt, and then, <laughs> and then he brings his trousers down to his ankles and leaves his pants down around. Because it was just so painful to have clothes on. And so he's and he's got he's just got his his underwear on, but he's got these rolls of you know of 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 um, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you can't abandon high school right. called rolls of Tommy. Right. <laughs> um, and and. He looks like he's sitting there stark naked. Right. And right, yeah. uh, and we're playing, and it. I, I mean, it was it was it was really really. He was suffering, but the, he had the he had the whole place in in stitches. And then on a break, Steve Schaefer and I ran down to the ran down to the um, to the store and got him some you know some spray stuff to ease the aloe vera or something whatever like that was, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 but um yeah tommy would was that an orchestra date or was that like a, a pickup date like just guitars or no something? that was orchestra that was an orchestra. so you were sitting in front of an orchestra or yeah. in a booth no in front of the orchestra oh, <laughs> so, right so imagine you had you and tommy and anybody else and the and composer then, right in front of it yeah and then <laughs> just an orchestra of you know 70 oh, yeah. players behind you oh, oh yeah. my gosh it was the funniest thing <sighs> yeah so um, if there's pictures of that anywhere, you know, if that happened today, it oh, would be yeah. on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh my that, gosh! I mean, Tommy was Tommy was was a character. Yeah. And um, one thing I, I noticed too, it seems like a lot of the session guys that I've known through the years, the 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 guys that did it a lot, particularly in those days, they always had a joke at the ready. Mm -hmm. You know, you always wanted. I, I noticed that nobody really wants to be cooped up with a, a Debbie Downer, right? right. You could be the best player in town, but if you're a bummer to be around, nobody wants to be around you. Right? Oh, exactly. Yeah, so you kind of had to be a fun person to be around. I mean, Ish. you know, if 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 there if if there is a a jerk as a player, it's going to come out sooner or later. Yeah. And and because yeah. of the get, pressure, they get weeded out. Yeah, they get weeded out. Yeah. It's like no, yeah, you're right. Nobody nobody wants to wants to be around. Guys that are you know that that have big egos and and, right. and um, there were a few guitar players when I first started that ended up getting weeded out for that that reason and good players too yeah yeah we, we don't need to name names no, I, I, any other Tommy any other Tommy stories you can think of well there was um, uh, this was a, this was a sight reading story that um, Tommy Dennis Buttimer and I were at I think we we're at Disney. Um, and Dennis, earlier in the day, this was an afternoon session, and earlier in the day, Dennis had this session where he had this part to play that was pretty pretty intense. So he took the part with him, and he knew he was going to see Tommy in the afternoon, so he he, he said, brought it, said, Tommy, look at this part I had to play. Tommy looked at it, said, oh, yeah, it looks, looks pretty hard. He said, what, what was the tempo? He said, well, it was like here. So Tommy put it up and, on the stand. He played it double time. No, double, double the double the tempo. And Dennis and I are looking at each other, going, "Whoa!" Part of what Tommy had just... was a photographic memory, so he could look, he could look at four or five lines of music, yeah. and have it memorized. And yeah, and that's that's one of another tricks that you try to do if you can get it down is have your eyes ahead. Right. Don't let every note be a surprise. You need to be like a bar ahead if you can get a bar ahead. You need to be, yeah, you need to, um, you know, the, the back back in, I don't know, 20 years ago, they used to advertise this Evelyn Woodard uh, speed reading yeah, courses yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff. And the, the idea was you look at a whole, you look at a whole paragraph at right. one time. And you, you try and do that with music. You know, you look look at what's coming up and memorize, you know, memorize what you have to play in the moment right. so you could be ready for what's coming up. And sometimes, like, I, I noticed too on, on like, sc film score dates, um, you, you, there may be an hour of music total, right. you know, or more. 
um, and there's themes. And so once you get halfway through the session or even a, a third in, you're starting to run across similar themes. There may be variations, so you've got to keep your eyes open for that. But then there's scores that you work on that are like, you, you did the omen, right? and, and where there, it's maybe very atonal. So right. there's nothing you can really hang your hat on melodically and go, oh, this is familiar, I've played this before, right. whether it be melodically or rhythmically. So I imagine that that requires more reading chops in that in that kind of thing. Yeah, and and you know, it it's it's a <laughs> it's a gift when you when you have reoccurring things. Mm -hmm. Um but you, you have to be prepared for when of course you know, for the opposite. Right. So if yeah. if if stuff is um uh, uh, That's the ninety percent boredom stuff that, right. that that Tommy talks about. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, Tommy used to say, "Yeah, you could train a chimpanzee to do ninety percent of what we have to do as studio musicians." But then, you know, we get called in for those times where you know you got to be able to sit down and 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 perform. Right. So I, I had a I have a friend that's I've been working with and for for thirty years, and he brought me in on a TV show. Um, before I was really ready, but the cool thing was I was second chair guitar on it, and I got to work with Michael Thompson, John Goo, uh, Grant Geisman, Dean Parks. Mm -hmm. So I had the, the the other chair was every week was different, mm -hmm. but I had I was the same you know right. chair number two every day, and it was really a huge learning experience. And that was where I got to see Michael Thompson and you, Dean Parks, the the his cartridge guy plugged power into his pedal board and blew his whole system. Oh, wow. So when he showed up, nothing worked. So he he had his Les Paul. We were doing kind of a southern rock thing. He had a, his Les Paul, and um, they had a Mesa boogie, and he plugged straight into that, and he made it sing. Oh, yeah. He's a wonderful <laughs> guitar player. He's wonderful an amazing musician. guitar player. Yeah. yeah, he really is. And I loaned him a slide, <laughs> and I never got it back. It was my favorite slide, too. <laughs> I never got it. I mentioned it to him like... A couple of years ago, I ran into him, and uh, he goes, "Oh yeah, I remember that slide. You want me to try to find it for you?" Yeah. I'm like, "No, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I've replaced it. I found it, you know, but it was my favorite slide at the time. Uh, and I think I I lifted it from a friend. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I like borrowed it and then never gave it back. So, <laughs> yeah, the, it's karma. Um, okay, so um, let me. Uh, so uh, now I saw that there was a Phil Spector. Did you you work with Phil Spector? Was that on an album? I'm assuming because that's really what he tended to do. We. Um, uh, when I first started, before actually before I started doing sessions with Tommy, I was in a band that oh. got signed by Phil Spector, and um, yeah, he was doing that, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was signing bands, and and um, it's kind of the next level above producer. Yeah, yeah, it's the next thing. So, yeah. oh, so I've got stories to tell with Phil Spector. That, that can you? I mean, yeah, he's uh, he can't come after me. He's gone. <laughs> That's right. He passed away, didn't he? Yeah, he's gone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> But there were there were some stories that that you would not believe if I would if I was not there to see what what went down what went down I probably would not believe the stories but I I saw all this stuff firsthand and and um, maybe one little example if well, you can if you can't I understand yeah we were um, we were working at A and M Records and keep it PG thirteen though. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we were we were at AM Records. Oh yeah, the Hens Henson now. I know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, and we were in Studio Studio A. Been there many times. Right. And and they had a, a beautiful Trident board, and um, uh, oh, yeah. he relieved himself on the console. We got kicked out of there. We had to go finish the record at at. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm assuming number one, right? <laughs> number one. <laughs> okay. We we had to go finish the record at uh, at Gold Star, uh, but it, and one one day at Gold Star, yeah, I know, yeah, he had the he had the playback so loud we couldn't. None of the band members could be in the in the booth listening back because he had it so loud. And he went up and put his head right in. He, there were these big. Uh, voice of the theater kind of speakers, yes, uh, yeah. wooden, yeah. wooden playback yeah. things, yeah. and they were on pedestals. It was so loud, the thing, one of them fell off, and and a splinter went in his eye from the from from the cabinet. So we had to stop the session, rush him to the hospital, get the splinter taken out of his eye. Um, <laughs> Did I, you ever get the record done? <laughs> well, yeah, he, the record the record got finished, but but he shelved it. Yeah, he yeah. he just you know. 
it was uh, either a tax write-off for him or he got into other projects and didn't have time to, you know, he probably did this with, with many groups. I, I, I've been on so many records that have been shelved. Yeah. yeah. That's all, more records get shelved than released. Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah, he was, a he was also a very interesting character. He was, he was a, a black belt in karate. Yes. And, um, <laughs> we were, one night after a, one of the sessions, we the whole, he took everybody to Michelli's on uh, Lancashire for pizza, yeah. and we we're in there, and uh, uh, he was real loud, and you know he, he I mean he used to just get a, a kind of obnoxious a little bit, you know. After just, drinking or just always? Well, he was always drinking. He, okay. he drank. He had a he'd always have a bottle of wine with a long straw in it, and he'd just be sipping on <laughs> sipping on. <laughs> I'm so, uh, That's funny. So he he was real loud. So he went in the bathroom. And somebody had said something to him, you know, you're like, what, what a jerk you are, or something. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it sounded like, you know, one of those cartoons where, you know, you, you see you see a, a guy go in the, like a gorilla, and a guy go in a bathroom or someplace, right, right. and you hear all this pounding, and <laughs> it's like stuff uh, stuff breaking and everything. And you see, you see him come out. And his hair's all like, you know, whacked right, out, right. his shirt's torn. More than normal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his yeah. shirt's torn. He goes, he lays a few hundred bucks down on the table. He goes, we better get out of here. I think I just killed a guy. <laughs> so it, was like, it was always something, though. Every time we, every time we did a session, it was, it was something else. That's crazy. Gold Star, um, did that become something else? What was what's what was yeah, East probably West? Probably tanning salon, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Gold Star was in a strip mall, wasn't it? It was kind of on. on it was on a street. I remember seeing pictures of it. It was just kind of on the street. Yeah, like on Santa Monica or something. I it think. was on a uh, one of the one of the side streets oh, one that side ran street. that ran. Um, uh, I can't remember which street. The Gold Star was the one that had that street. reverb chamber that 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 Phil used so much. Yeah, was, I yeah. think that was Gold Star was an amazing studio. Yeah. yeah, but it's. I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, East West used to be. Uh, what was East West before it was East West? I can't remember. Anyway, I've yeah, I've only done a couple records at East, East West. Oh, I got to show you something. Can I, it, 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 no, look at this. It, it's like I finally arrived. <laughs> I have my own parking spot. That's awesome. Well, I love that. I love that. So I kept it. Yeah, East West. It's, yeah, it's it's an interesting studio because they 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 decorated they had a an artist come in a, like a weird artist come in and decorate the lobby and everything yeah it's kind of got this weird weird but it's, what an amazing sounding studio yeah. you've worked on a lot of movies tvs you worked on records uh, i just want to talk about i want you to tell the bet midler story if you're comfortable telling that yeah. story yeah. um and uh, by the way she's a pretty funny lady yeah um and I, I remember she had a show that came out i think it lasted six, six episodes but i remember the opening scene from the bet Mid this i think it was called the bet midler show and she's on. She's in her master bedroom on her treadmill running. Her husband walks in and he thinks he's being funny. He says, "What are you running from?" And she goes, "My ass." <laughs> and I went, "That she probably came up with that line." You know, yeah. that was. I'm like, okay, that's a pretty funny line. So, t so, so you're working with an orchestra. Yeah, we were doing a movie called Jinxed. Oh right, I know that. Yeah, that, that's like a, a witch or something. She's a witch. In I don't or something know. Like that. I never saw it. And 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 the. The arranger wrote complex parts, typically, right? Billy Byers. He wrote um, uh, he wrote a guitar part that was really noty, like just you know on top of the orchestra, and it was it was kind of, it was it was almost a feature, but it was just kind of enhancing the orchestra and and you know playing arpeggios and stuff around the orchestra and, and lines and, and stuff. So we're we're she, uh, Bet Miller's in the booth. She happened to come to the session, and so we're playing and and. Um, uh, you know, I'm playing the part as written. So she gets on the talk back, stops the orchestra, guitar player, you're too busy. I said, okay, I'll start taking Fridays off. <laughs> you'd, have thought, you'd have thought I flipped her off or something. I mean, she... <laughs> but she, the orchestra roared. Uh, that, well, that's the thing. Every, I, there, the joke was on her, basically, which I didn't mean to do. No, no, no. It no. was one of those things where you, you open your mouth and, and insert your foot. You and you'd never said that before. That just came right there. Well, it, it just... Uh, um, a natural, funny it thing. It just came out. Yeah. yeah it's hilarious. It no, I've said this... Out. I've told this story many times. In fact, my live stream audience knows this story because I've told it. And the thing was, is in any room Bette Midler's in, she's supposed to be the funniest person in the room. Oh, yeah. 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 So, but I didn't mean to be funny. I, I mean, I just, okay, well, 
you're too busy. Okay, I'll start taking Fridays up. <laughs> it's a great line. And literally everybody, everybody in the room was busting up. Like this was like a you know a two minute long laugh. Yeah. yeah. And and she was like she was not happy. Evidently, <laughs> so I had to edit the part, you know, yeah. play the part simpler or whatever, um, and which is pretty easy to do actually when you have a real hard part and you have to edit it. You just play every third note <laughs> or turn out every half. Yeah, yeah, turn yeah. Out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, or play. You know, the the usually you get you you get some um, some uh, headway from the you know from the the composer and just say you know do what you think. You went uh, that, then there was a, a t like a break like a five oh, yeah. minute and she comes out oh yeah when uh, when they when you get a ten minute you get a ten minute break every hour right so when it came to break time she came out of the booth and right at me and I'm going oh no so um, <laughs> so she had seen me earlier going into my guitar trunk I, you know we a big guitar trunk that the that the uh, cartridge company yeah. takes around so I. Uh, she made me go and take every instrument out of it. She wanted to hear what every instrument sounded like. Yeah. So here, my whole break, yeah. my whole ten-minute break, I had to show her every instrument in my in my uh, in my trunk. And she just at at the end of the break, she turned around and walked away. <laughs> and that was it. And left me with all my instruments out. <laughs> and you had to put everything away. <laughs> and then, <laughs> oh man, that's that's pretty so, funny. That's that's pretty. That was payback. Yeah, yeah, that was payback. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. I love that story. I don't know why, but I just, I, I crack, it cracks me up. I think she's really funny, but that that is a hilarious line, and I bet you she probably used that line in a movie or a TV show or something, <laughs> know. you know? Pro the, the biggest album credit you have, I think, and probably by far when you consider sales, is um, Pink Floyd's The Wall. And... I, I, it was probably recorded in multiple studios, but it was recorded in L.A. largely. I was looking at the list of musicians on that record. Mm -hmm. Your father-in-law is on that record. Yeah. Frank Morocco is on that record. I'm assuming he played accordion. He didn't play anything yeah. else, right? Yeah, was here. So I, if there's accordion on, on Pink Floyd's The Wall, that's his father-in-law, mm -hmm. who passed away a few years ago. Yeah. Um, ten, it, actually. Ten, ten years ago. Ten, ten years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, and probably the most recorded organ or uh, accordion player... In history. Uh, in history. Definitely. Yeah. And um, Lee Rittenauer is on it. Mm -hmm. Tony Tennille sings backgrounds on it. Yeah. Uh, from Captain and Tennille, which is interesting. Right. Uh, Jeff Piccaro and Joe Piccaro are both on it. Right. Okay. So how, who called you for this? Um, Bob DiCaro. Was he one of the or producers? Frank, no, I'm sorry. Frank DiCaro. Frank, was he one of the producers or was he in the... No, he was a, the contractor. The contractor for the... So basically the contractors know what you do. You yeah. know, I mean, they they know uh, pretty much what you know what you if you have a specialty or whatever. And I was um, I was known f in town oh, for. Is that your phone? Oh. Is that my no, my phone? Oh, gone. Scam likely. So I won't answer. Oh, that. Yeah, don't answer. That. <laughs> so so I got uh, I got called by uh, by Frank DeCaro and um, who knew that I knew that I played. Uh, Classic or fingerstyle, yeah, yeah. Uh, fingerstyle. One, one of your fortes. And and um, uh, I got the call because David Gilmore they uh, had tried to play something with um, with a felt pick. He didn't he didn't play fingerstyle at all. So uh, so I got the call and I showed up at the studio and they didn't have anything written. Um, their uh, uh, the song was uh, is there anybody out there? Is there anybody out there? Right. So, um, was there anything recorded, or were you the first thing on? No, tape? I was the only thing. Yeah, because yeah. that's all you. Well, it, yeah, and then they added everything else after after the fact. They okay. added. Um, yeah. uh, was there a click? No, no, it was just me. <laughs> so um, uh, they kind of they they basically um, Bob Ezrin had come up with the the three note um you know it's it's it, that almost james bond yes, sounding yeah, e f yeah. f sharp mm -hmm. e, uh, back to f back to e so he came he he had come up, come up with that those three note uh that three note pattern and that's all they had so he 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 and david gilmore and i sat down in uh in the booth and um they kind of told me what they were looking for so i'd play something they go yeah do that and i'd Play something else. Yeah, put that with it, and, and we constructed the whole thing that way. Then I went in and recorded it. 
Okay, so yeah, so you, you kind of worked it out, and then and then and they were sitting there when you worked it out. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So, and then once you had it down, is that the first take that we hear? Or? We no, we did about ten takes. Okay, just uh, Bob Bob Ezrin is an amazing producer, yeah. and he he had he had a specific. Uh, performance that he wanted. He was looking for something that he, just yeah. he would. Yeah, you know, he wanted a specific performance, and um, you know, I, I probably one of the first two or three takes would have been my choice, um, but he he wanted more, and finally, I, maybe yet after after about ten takes, he goes, "That's the one." We oh, need. okay. So it was the tenth one. A lot of times you're right. It's the first take is always the almost always the best, right? And then you're just trying to replicate that. But I, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking. But about. But I was trying to memorize what I had, what we had put together right. as well. Yeah. So maybe I sounded more confident, or uh, you, if there's hesitation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. maybe I sounded more confident, or whatever. Ten takes in, or maybe he just wanted to, you know, see what the what the parameters were. The you know, how good can you play this or whatever. Right. Funny thing. Funny thing is, um, uh, years later, probably, oh, maybe five, six years ago now, a buddy of mine had run into Bob Ezrin and, and said, hey, remember Joe de Blasi, you know, uh, uh, worked on the wall, uh, anybody out there? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I would totally remember. So he said, well, he's one of my best friends. So he, he said, let me get him on the phone. So <laughs> he gets me on the phone and, and Bob, Bob said, well, he said, now I think I could play that song better than you could. And I said, well, you've had 40 years to practice it. <laughs> I came up with it on the spot. Yeah, yeah. And he laughed. <laughs> Where, what studio was that at? Do you remember? Sunset Sound. Oh, Sunset Sound. Okay, yeah. 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 That's, yeah that's a great studio. Yeah. Uh, Excellent studio. And um, oh, well, another cool thing for guitar players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, David Gilmore is the nicest guy you'd ever want to Oh, meet. good. He yeah. was such... I was going to ask. Yeah, He yeah. was so nice. Um, and Roger Waters, who took the writing credit for what I did, wasn't even there. So, uh, uh, he may have had something to do with the three-note phrase, you know, the E, F, F sharp, Hard or, know, James yeah. Bond yeah, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Um, but he took the writing credit for it and then learned it note for note and put out a video of himself saying that this was his demo of oh my god of of what i played well we've all i mean i've been there too I, so um now that was your ramirez yeah do you have that guitar here is it out it's it's, it's in the closet it's packed away i can pull it out if you, you want. want you want to pull out the ramirez that you played on sure okay we can do that hold on give it take a break here this is the beast Probably it's heavy. Way. Wow, that's that's amazing. Pretty deep. Pretty pretty. That is a gorgeous. Yeah, my uh, yeah. I have a um, I have a Ramirez flamenco. Oh wow. Sorry. It's a really big sounding guitar, yeah. Especially out in front of it. So yeah. I'm not going to have you play it though, because I don't want to. I don't want to have a, a copyright strike against me. Oh, okay. Well, and also I've got no fingernail. You know, I just had. I had. I broke my thumbnail the other just a couple days ago, and I went in and ha I never go to a nail salon, but she actually did a really good job on it. Oh yeah. Uh, she made it. Made it. Saved it. Right. Basically, because I yeah, cracked it. Mine. Mine are all done at the nail salon. Oh, okay. So I have to go have that one fixed. My, you know, as you get older, your your nails get soft. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. So this is the guitar I use. That's just it's I a gorgeous. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's a Brazilian rosewood yeah. back yeah. back and sides. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's. I was 19 years old when I went to uh, to Spain to buy this, and um, I went right to the factory. And wow. It was amazing. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So you were studying classical guitar in college at that yeah. point? Okay, yeah. so you knew. And Ramirez have been like the instrument. They were the instrument for years, decades. Yeah. And um, for my taste, they still are. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, I, I don't think that um, another classical guitar company that, that I've heard 
has the consistency and the, the you know with the volume and the, the tone that these have. Um, Christopher Parkening again, who's a, a, a close friend. Um, that's all he'll play. He won't play anything but a Ramirez. Okay. So and and I mean, it used to, you yeah. know, he's that's he may be one of the best players the best on the planet. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely true. I think I got everything I need. I want to just thank you so much. This is fun. Pleasure. I love it. Uh, most of these stories you. I've heard. <laughs> The the uh, the Phil Spector ones were new, uh, um, <clears throat> but most of these stories we've talked about, and and I, I have a couple. Um, one one is when I um, was I decided at fifteen that I wanted to be a professional guitar player. Mm -hmm. At sixteen, I discovered that there was this career called studio guitar work, and that most of it was done in Los Angeles. And so I started recording with a cassette deck TV shows. I would put it next to the TV when the show was on. You know, it's not like you could, you know, watch it. There was no VHS right. or DVDs or anything. I had to wait for the show to come on. And I would hit record and record like uh, Rockford Files or uh, you know BJ Dan, and the Bear. Dan Ferguson. Dan uh -huh. Ferguson does all the really Rockford the Files. guitar solo yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, great playing. And so I would transcribe the guitar parts from those shows. Um, writing them out and made them look like the charts I would see in Tommy Tedesco's column in Guitar Player Magazine back in the 70s. Because you would get a little clue. And I would do, I would, every month I would read that article and go, oh, I could totally do that job. I can read that. Oh, that's, oh, cool. And he would, he would tell you a lot of the tips, you know, and right. say, hey, you got to simplify or whatever. Right. It's not playable. And um, so I, I'm, I'm telling Joe that I did this. And I would take these charts and I would set them on a stack with the cassette tape and wouldn't look at them for for six months and in six months later because that way I would forget them and that way I would be literally I would put the cassette in and I'd try to sight read along and of course I'd fail miserably but I'd try to sight read along with it and I told Joe that and he said well I was probably sight reading your play <laughs> in a lot of those shows Maybe yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing I, I did this session <clears throat> um, a while quite a while ago now it was a it was for a documentary um, it was for a documentary, and uh, the composer was Chris Anderson Bazzoli, and it was a documentary on a computer thing, um, on the uh, 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 some operating system thing, about 15 years ago. And um, the entire, every cue, and it was live orchestra, a small orchestra, every cue was in 7-8. So mm -hmm. after two days of recording on this, I'm driving home and I'm listening to four four you know songs in the radio and it's four four sounded funny to me <laughs> you know when, you, when you've done seven eight for for two eight hour days right. you just you're just not you know but but there was this one chart that was uh, fortunately I got the charts in advance and this one chart was it was in seven eight it was nothing but sixteenth notes he wanted it played on a twelve string and it was descending ostinato like descending. Uh, Lydian scales that modulated all over the place, okay? And so I spent, fortunately, I spent probably four or five hours just woodshedding this, and I realized if I tune the the E string down to D, and if I tune the, the D string up to E, I can actually play these descending Lydian scales very easily. <laughs> and I was telling Joe this, and he goes, no, you just hand it back to him and say, it's not playable. <laughs> <laughs> You can do that. <laughs> Had you ever done that? Did you ever get a part where you just said this is not playable? I, I or you just were, make it work. There were many, there were many times I, I got stuff that was impossible to play. And uh, the one thing you don't want to do is make the composer look bad. Yeah. You 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 want to bail the composer out because he's just like he's the one that that basically hired you mm -hmm. um, or rec you know uh, requested you. Yeah. He's he answers to somebody who's probably sitting in the booth, right? So, um, you 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 want to make him look good. There, you, our job is is pretty much to uh, you know not only to play the music uh, the best we could possibly play it and and interpret it you know um, yeah in, interpret it uh, uh, authentically. But it, if if there's something that's not right. Um, Actually, the worst thing you could do is hand it back to him and say yeah, it's yeah, not playable. Yeah. We, you, were, you were being facetious, right. but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you want to do is um, is is make make him look good. Yeah. So yeah. you know, um, uh, you might you might say something that um, you know. Can I? Can, you mind if I take a little bit of liberty on this? I, I think I could um, 
come up with something that'll really enhance you know what you've written right right you don't want to say it, it sucks <laughs> or you can't <laughs> or you can't play it yeah. or it doesn't lay on the guitar yeah you know, i don't have those notes on the guitar yeah, right exactly yeah. so yeah you you you, you want to make him sound uh look good okay. you don't want to you don't want to yeah yeah bag on the, com on the composer so that's why those guys don't call me anymore because i handed the truck no I'm just <laughs> um yeah no it's it's funny because i i do i have a reputation particularly with one composer i work with he he you know, he will even say, don't reinvent the guitar for me. Right. Let me know if it's not playable. And I always figure a way to do it. Right. Um, and, and I've got this thing called the spider capo where I can push down one string here and one string sure. up there. You know, and that way, if I need a, a, like a high E in the middle of this thing, I can capo it and have it right. just that one note. Sure. Um, and so I've always figured out a way to make pretty much anything work. But that's why I love working from home because I'm kind of the king of the punch in. I can, I can get, right. you know. Uh, but if I had to, if I had to do some of the stuff I do in my studio, in front of an orchestra, I'd have a one day career. I guarantee it. <laughs> so I, I'm. That's where I'm just you blow me away because you did it for 35 years. You've done it for forever, and you, you know you. The fact that you did it two days says that you made them happy the first day that you were able to do it and you didn't, you were fearless. And I know you said on the inside, you might be fearless, you know, and that's one of the ways I've kind of dealt with fear too, is I like, I just tell myself I'm the man. Just say, you're the man. They hired you to do this. It's yeah. your job. Right. They think you can do it. Right. So you think you can do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And inside you're going, why did they hire me? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and I'm not going to reveal it, but I always, the first time I met you uh, was at my church at Shepherd. And uh, you gave me your email address, and your email address was like, wait, no, that, you know, is, is basically, uh, you know, basically said guitar amateur, let's say that. I'm not going to say, I don't want to say what it is, uh, but, you know, it was like guitar amateur, and I'm like, no, this guy's been, you know, like on everything. So it was, it was really fun. And, you know, you're very humble. And the first thing you mentioned whenever you talk about your career is Tommy and how Tommy gave you your career. And, Tommy was a blessing to a lot of people, and um, you know I know Denny. You know Denny. I'm sure I'm sure you know Denny well. Denny, uh, uh, his son. Yeah, Denny. We well, we spent every Christmas at, at the Tedesco's, so we were there. You know, we were there for many years, uh, Christmas Eve with you know with them. Tommy would dress up like Santa and come off the roof, and <laughs> you'd hear they had a recording of, of sleigh bells and yeah, and, yeah. and and and. Uh, uh, reindeer and and they had they had the, the sound effects everything and then he would come off the roof with a big bag of stuff for all the kids and right, right. it was like it was uh, it was amazing those were great years I love the story of, of him doing the gong show oh he did the gong show and you're like why would he do the gong show well he 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 knew how to work the business he was amazing. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did it in a tutu. He did it in a tutu, but he wrote the song. Mm -hmm. So he wrote it, sang it, performed it live. So it's like triggered every quadruple, triple, double that you could ever. He, that was has to be SAG because he sang it. Right. It was his song, <laughs> so he got royalties. Exactly. And then and he played guitar, so there might have been an AFM a Federation of Musicians kind of segment thrown in there as well. Right. I mean, it was just hilarious, you know. Right. That he, but that's what he. That was one of the articles in Guitar Player. He talks about that, and that's right. why he did it. Was just like he made a bank on it. Another amazing thing that he, actually he and my father-in-law Frank did was Fernwood Tonight. Yes. That was yeah. That was uh, that was such a fun show. You can actually see Tommy in that. He's yeah. in the episode. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so Fernwood tonight was a uh, uh, parody kind of a show. Yeah, it was. Um, uh, in fact, um, Martin Mull's show, I think. Right. Martin Mull was part of it. Martin Mull went to um, the school of my te my sister teaches at Rhode Island School of Design. Right. Well, I used to hang with Martin Mull at his. Uh, he had a, a beach house in Malibu, and he's a, he's a great jazz guitar player. He had a, yes. He had the most amazing L five. Oh. I used to try and. When when are you going to sell me this guitar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen him so go joke. hang and play. Uh, and stuff. Um, uh, West Montgomery's L5 is at, at the Children's Museum in Indianapolis. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've seen that one up close. Right. And, of course, it's just been sitting in the case for so long. The action was like this high. Right. But he might have played it like that. So many of those guys, they did play it. You know, that yeah. was how they got their tone. Was yeah. A really high action with those flat wound strings. Right. So, okay. Well, anyway, I, I could literally talk to you for hours. <laughs> you know, this is more fun than I'm allowed to have. And uh, so, anyway, thank you, Joe. And we will... Thank you. Uh, I will put this up soon. And, uh, of course... It's not live, so I don't know why I'm talking like it is. Anyway, <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.